Well, hello there, everybody. <clears throat> we are in chapter three of Colossians. As if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So we're living in this world. We've got to take care of things, but our heart should be in heaven. Our treasure should be in heaven, and we should be thinking about how we're going to be with God forever. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. So we've got to go about our daily life, but the main focus of our life should be on the things above and things of God. And remember, he says, don't be conformed to this world. So the world is going to want to squeeze you into their mold. So the world has women's lib movement, and the church has to have one. Forget what the Bible says. The world has a gay rights movement, now the church has to have one. That's being conformed to this world. we got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So, we've died, and our life hidden with Christ. And here's a guy that's hidden, so we're hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So he's going to come in the clouds, and we're going to be with him. If it's the rapture, we'll be at the end. We'll go up and meet him. Otherwise, if we already died, Jesus is going to raise us up. He's going to raise up everybody, billions and billions of people. So res res resurrection of judgment or resurrection of life. So in Matthew, where a couple dozen people get raised after Jesus' resurrection, that's not a problem because he's going to raise billions of people up, everybody. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, we're saved by faith, but we need to have a changed life. And it's not it's faith alone that justifies, but the faith that justifies is not alone. So we need to put to death the immorality, and then passion, evil desire, and then covetousness. So we need to be content with what God gives us and not be covetous. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Now, people don't want to talk about the wrath of God. They want to talk about how God's loving. I read that these people were taking psychedelics and took away their fear of death. Well, if you're a non-Christian, you should have a fear of death. That's not a good thing to take away the fear of death. Maybe that'll lead you to repentance. So God's wrath is coming. He's going to judge everybody. He's going to, if you don't know Christ... That means you're going to have to get there by your good works, and everybody falls short. So the wrath of God is coming. Unless you know Christ, you're going to experience God's wrath. You're going to be separated from him forever. In these, you two once walked when you were living in them. So we were just like the world. We're just sinners saved by grace. We're one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. We're not, there's no place for self-righteousness or holier than thou. We were all sinners just like everybody else, and we still are. But hopefully, we'll be getting more holy as we go. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander. Wow. Now watch that. When you talk about somebody else, be careful not to slander. Obscene talk. Guess what? Christians shouldn't use obscene talk. I remember I once worked in a power plant, and these two guys, they're going, whoa, 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 whoa. And I said, why are you saying, whoa, whoa? And this Christian that had worked, they'd worked with about 10 years said a curse word the day before, and they were still talking about it the next day. 
So that's good. I mean, it's not good that he said that, but at least he had a track record. So Christians should not be using foul language. Just like same thing in Ephesians. Let no corrupting talk or rotten word come out of your mouth. Okay. Now, who has heard of an Ubersturm Gruppenführer? Here is the Ubersturm Gruppenführer. Now, if this guy, let's suppose you're Corey Ten Boom and you've got some Jews hidden in your place. And the guy comes and says, do you have any Jews? Do you say, well, I don't want to lie to you, buddy. Here they are. No, you don't want to do that. So when it says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, it's not talking about saying yes, telling the Ubersturm Gruppenführer where the Jews are, because, all right, they don't have the moral right for the truth, for one thing. And then Joe Suzuki says, well, it's not loving to turn in the Jews. So that's another reason. So you don't have to, you can lie to people if they don't deserve the truth, like the uh, guy that wants to kill Jews. And put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So we got the old self we used to live without. Now we're putting on the new self. And it's up to us to do this. We got to put on the new self. We've got to be renewed in knowledge. We got to study the Bible. We've got to go fellowship, listen to sermons, teaching, renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So we're in the image of God. That means, for among other things, it means we're persons. It means we have a sense of self-transcendence. We can get above ourselves. But we are in the image of God, not in terms of like omnipotence and things like that, but he's a person and we are persons. So never stop learning and obeying. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. It's, it's hard to imagine what it was like in the first century because the Jews and Gentiles did not like each other. I mean, barbarian, that's a non-Greek because when they talked, it sounded like they're saying bar, 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 bar. So they call them barbarians. In fact, they still call them today barbarians. So back in the first century, Jews and Gentiles just did not get along. And a bunch of Jews wanted the Gentiles to become Jewish and get circumcised and so forth. And it almost split the church. So that's what he's talking about here. It doesn't mean that certain groups don't do things better than others in general. Like if you go to Dominican Republic, it's a much higher percentage of people that can play baseball. And you can play baseball in Japan, Korea, even Taiwan. And then you go to um, Switzerland, nobody. So different groups can do different things in general sometimes. It does not talking about that. It's talking about in Christ. We all become Christians and we're all valued in God's sight. And he doesn't look above one group above another. Circumcised, uncircumcised. It, that commandment is gone. That was part of the Old Testament law. And we don't distance ourselves from the Old Testament. We dis distance ourselves from the Old Covenant so we don't have the old covenant anymore. So we don't have to get circumcised. We don't have to do the food laws. We don't have to have the Jewish the, the king in Israel and so forth. That's all gone. So Christ is all in all. Everybody is welcome in God's sight. Everybody can come to Christ. You don't have to become a Jew. You don't, you don't have to, he's not going to show favoritism to certain groups. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now, here we're called God's chosen ones. And it blows my mind that people try and say God doesn't choose individuals. Now, I am a born again Christian. I believe in Jesus. I believe I was chosen before the foundation of the world. I believe I'm a chosen one. What, is it, what does this mean that God doesn't choose individuals? Well, he chooses it in Christ. Okay, so he chooses individuals in Christ. The Bible is clear on this, that 
God chooses individuals. Okay. Now, now I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we get to fellowship with each other. The bad news is we get to fellowship with each other. Because unless you're on a lockdown, you're going to have fellowship. And I'm a pretty reclusive person anyway, and I'm starting to have cabin fever here because there's just no substitute for a real live church, a real live church with real live people. Okay, it says bearing with one another. There are going to be times when somebody's going to wrong you or somebody's going to say something stupid or in some way hurt you. And what does the Bible say? It says we are to forgive, bearing with one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord forgave you, so also you also must forgive. So Jesus said the same thing. He said this guy, he owed a bunch and guy forgave him. And then this other guy owed him just a little bit and he threw him in jail and got all mad. And the guy, the owner, the guy that gave him the, forgave all that stuff, threw him in jail. So we're not going to lose our eternal salvation, but it's, it's in terms of our fellowship here in, on this life, we need to forgive. It can, it can hurt, um, very often it can hurt uh, answers to prayer if you're just harboring bitterness all the time and uh, can hurt your marriage. So now if, if you've got a church where there's fellowship, then, I mean, the pastor could say something, to do, he could do something, anybody could. The whole idea is to be forgiving and not to be eaten alive with bitterness all the time. Here we have the passage in Matthew and the guy didn't want to forgive. He says, in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, this is in terms of fellowship here on earth. It's not like he's going to tear up the adoption certificate and throw you out of the kingdom, but it will affect your Christian life here on earth. We need to be forgiving. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The Christian life should be characterized by love. And Jesus said, by this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And I love that, be thankful, because I've been kind of convicted about that. It, Really, I want to spend like a lot of time every day thanking God because he's always, he's always giving out the blessing. He keeps giving me one blessing after another. And I know oh, that's a nice blessing. And so we need to be thankful people. Okay? Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So inside, we're going to have the peace of Christ ruling. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now that's funny. How are these guys going to let the word of Christ dwell in them? The Bible scholars say that the gospel was written a couple generations after Christ, even as late as like second century. So how are they going to let the word of Christ dwell in them richly? Because this is written in 63. Well, Here's how they do it. The Gospels weren't written at 100 AD. They were written like in the 50s. Okay. The, now, let me tell you. So the Bible scholars, they say the Gospels were written in the 80s, 90s, even second century. I say the Gospels were written in the 50s. Now, why do I say that? First, the Bible scholars. This is El Bumpo. I worked here in 1973 at Magic Mountain. And when I was working at El Bumpo, there was a newspaper article that said, did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? Most biblical scholars say no. So if most biblical scholars say Jesus did not rise from the dead, that means 
that they're not Christians. Say, Robert, you're God. You got to be God to know they're not Christians. You know, you don't have to be God to know. If someone says Jesus did not rise from the dead, you can know they're not a Christian, even though you are not God. So these non-Christian Bible scholars, now on El Bumpo, I learned how to say, walk faster in Cantonese Chinese. So I'm loading a bunch of people from from Hong Kong onto the boats. And I told the guy to walk faster in Chinese. He just about fell in the water. So why do I think it's written in the 50s? Why do I think these guys could let the peace of Christ, the word of God, Christ rule in their hearts? Because look at this. This is 1 Timothy written in about 65. And what does he say? He says, the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. Well, guess what? That's in Luke. Luke is already scripture by 65. And everybody says Luke used Mark. So that would put that back. So I think, I think Mark was written in the 50s. I think Luke was written in the 50s. There wasn't this long period before they wrote it down. And, okay. Um, all right. So, the, the gospel, now, even if they were right, even if they were written like in 90 or something, it's sort of about the time between now and World War II. And even if they were written then, people that were in World War II, they're still alive and they can talk and they often have very good memories of minute details in World War II. I like to study World War II history and so I'm watching on YouTube and these guys are running around interviewing veterans from World War II. And they're all in their 90s at least. And most of them are very coherent and they're going into great detail about what they did in World War II. So even if they were written then, there'd be plenty of eyewitnesses around that corroborate what they said. But I don't think they were written then. I think they were written in the 50s because this is already scripture in 65, Luke. There he is. That's, that's what he quotes. So it's already scripture. There it is, Luke 7, 10, 7. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the labor deserves his wages. So this is already scripture by 65. Luke probably wrote it in the 50s. Mark was written before that. It wasn't a great deal of time for the, the Gospels to be written down. Now, I don't normally do this, but we're going to have homework assignment. All right. We're going to use flashcards. Now, this is Viz Ed flashcards. And it's kind of a shame because they went out of business. I guess there's too many flashcards online, but I mean, I've got just about all of them and they're really great. And I bought a whole bunch of extra blank ones for my Bible memory verse. But what we're going to do for our homework is start to let the word of Christ dwell in us. And here's what we're going to do. First thing, though, you got to know how to fill out the card. You could use a three by five. There are people that still sell blank cards. I bought a whole bunch of blank cards on, on Amazon. And I still got thousands of the Viz Ed blank cards, so I'm good. But this tip I picked up from AI Ruby, who was my math teacher at heart. And this is to keep you from getting carpal tunnel syndrome. The way you fill out these cards, because people do it wrong. All right, look at this. I grab the card, look at the way I turn it. Ooh, carpal tunnel, that is wrong. That's the wrong way to fill out the card. Okay, there's the front, and here's the correct way to fill out the card. So you just turn it like that with your finger. That's the way to go. So. Your homework, we're going to fill out a verse, okay? Fill it out like that. So here we go. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, all right? This is our verse. So what you need to do is to get 
most people have a three by five. You can use a three by five or you could use, you could buy some cards on Amazon. They're different shape than the Viz Ed blank cards, but they still work. And you write this down and then you memorize it. You just look at it throughout the day and look at it, look at it until you've got it learned and then you get your pile of verses going and review them every week. And then you got the word of Christ dwelling in you richly when you need the word of God, when you need something, a verse that applies to a certain, certain thing, you got it in your head. Also, it's really nice if the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly. It's really nice if you, um, when you're drifting off to sleep, you could just meditate on the word of God. Or if you're hanging out, you can just meditate on the word of God. Or if Satan tries to put bad thoughts in your head, you can meditate on the word of God and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And we even have extra credit. My students used to just love extra credit. So if you write that first verse down, then you can write this verse down. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So you write down John 15, 7, you write down John 15, 8, and you memorize them. And that's letting Christ, the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Okay. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So we're supposed to be teaching people and not everybody's going to have the gift of teaching. They're not all going to get up front and teach, but everybody teaches everybody and everybody is going to be teaching in some format. Also admonishing one another. We need to tell people what they're doing wrong. We need to encourage them. We need to admonish one another in all wisdom. Singing Psalms. Did you ever sit there in church on Sunday morning and you're singing away and you go, hey, I think that's in Psalms. That's good. We're supposed to sing Psalms. Then it says hymns. So these people that are writing all this praise music, that's a good thing. That's biblical. Spiritual songs, that could even be um, songs in, in tongues, but whatever it is, it's definitely spiritually motivated and produced by the spirit. And there's the thankfulness again, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So everything we got to do, whether you're working or locked down or shopping or helping people, whatever you're doing, you're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you give thanks to God. That's it. Bye.